Good morning, and uh, welcome to Global Neurosciences Institute Grand Rounds. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Robert Satilov. Dr. Satilov is professor and chair of the Department of, of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Academic Specialties at Drexel University College of Medicine. He also holds adjunct professorships at Thomas Jefferson University, Temple University, and the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. He serves as a conductor of Thomas Jefferson University Choir. He graduated from Jefferson Medical College and completed residency in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and a fellowship in otology, neurotology, and skull-based surgery at the University of Michigan. Dr. Sandalov is chair of the boards of directors of the Voice Foundation and of the American Institute for Voice and Ear Research. He also has served as president of the American Laryngological Association and the International Association for Phonosurgery, the Pennsylvania Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, and the American Society of Geriatric Otolaryngology. Dr. Sadoloff is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Voice, editor emeritus of Ear, Nose, and Throat Journal. He has written over 1,000 publications, including 72 books, and he has been awarded more than $5 million in research funding. He has invented more than 75 laryngeal microsurgical instruments and a novel laryngeal prosthesis. His medical practice is limited to care of the professional voice and to otology, neurotology, skull-based surgery. Dr. Santolov is recognized as one of the founders of the field of voice, having written the first modern comprehensive article on care of singers and the first chapter and book, um, and book on care of the professional voice. Dr. Santolov will be talking today about dizziness. Dr. Sadala. Well, thank you for allowing me to join you this morning to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Most people are not all that happy when they hear they have four dizzy patients in the waiting room. <clears throat> I am. This condition gives us great opportunities to be detectives and to help people who really need it. Dizziness can be thought of as confusion about orientation in space. We have redundant systems that tell us where we are in space. If you're standing still and your right ear, for example, says, no, you're turning left, that confusion in signals, those conflicting signals, we interpret as dizziness impairment of our orientation in space. Our mission is to find out which component or components of the balance system are giving aberrant signals and to figure out ways to either correct the problem or eliminate the problem because of the redundancies, we can eliminate entire segments of the balance system without any significant adverse effect. This is a common disorder. Dizziness is a chief complaint in about 11 million physicians, physician visits annually and is the most common complaint for patients over 65. It's estimated that 20 to 30% of people over 65 have dizziness, 50% of people over 80, more of those who are in nursing homes. A, a substantial number of older people in particular and dizzy people in general fall. Falls can result in broken hips. And as you know, hip fractures have higher mortality than many of our surgical procedures. In fact, all of the surgical procedures that we use for dizzy patients. In people over 75, falls are the leading cause of death. And there are about a half a million serious head injuries a year, many of those from automobile accidents, and many of those from people getting dizzy and crossing the center line. So this is not just an annoyance. This is a really serious, complicated problem in which we can have major impact and can save lives, not only of the dizzy patients, but also of the people that they injure if they get disoriented while driving. Patients give us a long list of symptoms and we have books that tell us what they suggest, rotary vertigo. We think traditionally about 
peripheral disease, lightheadedness, we usually think of as not peripheral, ear-related disease, all sorts of descriptors, none of them is particularly valuable. You all have seen plenty of people with central disease, strokes, for example, who have rotary vertigo that looks typical of ear-related vertigo. And we see lots of peripheral disorder that is atypical. For example, acoustic neuromas are vestibular nerve tumors. Very few of those patients have rotary vertigo. They may have a little lightheadedness, a little back step at the end of a golf swing. So we get the history, but we can't rely on it very much. It is taught traditionally that if dizziness is associated with loss of consciousness, it's not coming from the ear. We look to the head, the heart, and otherwise. You can't count on that either. We have lots of excitable patients. Many of my, my favorite patients are my older Italian grandmothers from South Philadelphia who bring pit cells when they come in. If all of a sudden the world starts going around, they get very anxious, very scared. They can get vasovagal and pass out cold as a reaction to peripheral disease. So while we certainly want to get the history, we want to view the interpretation with skepticism with reference to what we're taught to think specific symptoms tell us. They may trend us in a direction, but they cannot be counted on. We require a comprehensive evaluation, history, physical, and appropriate testing because the balance system is so complex. It usually is not definitive to take our best bedside guess and not evaluate. When we do that, we're wrong a lot of the time. Now, <clears throat> I will take a moment to tell you something philosophically. I do a thorough comprehensive evaluation on everybody who comes to me because I am a quaternary care physician. If you are out in private practice and you don't get an MRI and balance testing and everything else the first time you see a patient with dizziness, and try some things and bring them back and follow them closely. And you have an important diagnosis that's delayed by three or six months. I will be the first to defend you. There, there are other considerations in different practice settings. So I speak from the perspective of a quaternary care referral center. I don't sleep well at night if anything leaves my office undiagnosed. But I stress to my residents that that is not the only correct way to practice medicine. You have to figure out what you're comfortable with and how much missed or delayed diagnosis you're willing to accept for the insurance company's notion of cost effectiveness. So with that background, there are some things in the history that can help us. Onset, obviously, if dizziness starts immediately following a head injury, that gives us a good hint. It does not necessarily mean it's concussion. It could be labyrinthine concussion. It could be cervical vertigo, which we'll talk about more. When, when we get hit in the head, especially at the level of minor head trauma or worse, there are a lot of structures that get jostled in addition to just the brain. Typically, again, in, in the textbooks, when dizziness is constant, we don't think so much about peripheral disease, but it can be. Related symptoms such as aura, visual or auditory aura, make us think about migraine or central disease. And we take a comprehensive medical history. As you'll see, there are systemic conditions that can cause dizziness. Occupational history should include not only information about 
what people are doing, lifting, carrying things on their shoulders or heads, but also exposures. There are still exposures to heavy metals and a variety of other toxins that can affect the balance system. Certain recreational pursuits, particularly soccer and wrestling, in which there are repeated head and neck injuries, can be associated with dizziness. If there is a dietary association, don't forget hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia exists. It's frequently missed. We, we evaluate it with a five-hour glucose tolerance test, which it's hard to get labs to do anymore. But if you do a five-hour glucose tolerance test in a dizzy patient and the sugar drops to 30 at the fourth hour and the patient reports typical symptoms at that time, you can put people on a hypoglycemic diet and their dizziness will go away. Some dizziness is curable. Psychiatric is a tough call. Anybody who is unpredictably incapacitated with dizziness has an emotional overlay. It's, it's a very disturbing condition and life quality. That doesn't mean that the emotional overlay is the etiology, but it has to be considered. There is familial dizziness <clears throat> and we all should be cautious about not forgetting pregnancy especially before we start injecting people with imaging contrast and potentially get x-rays in addition to just MRI scans. People in their 40s and sometimes older can still get pregnant and certainly in young people. So it should cross our minds and be ruled out before we do anything that might be construed as having caused a malformation when the child is born. Of course, trauma, direct trauma to the ear. Uh, one of the classics that we see is a kiss to the ear. Kisses can be noisy. And also if the lips seal over the ear canal, there's a substantial amount of pressure that can displace the ossicles. I have seen fistulas. Barrow trauma, similarly, and of course, head and neck trauma, with which you all are well familiar. So there are things that make us lean toward peripheral disease, the association of hearing loss, particularly unilateral hearing loss, the ability to lateralize. When you get dizzy, if I had to make you pick which ear was, is coming from, could you? Often patients will say no idea. Sometimes they'll without having give you a, given you a clean history before, we'll say, oh yeah, every time I get dizzy, I, I, I feel this fullness in my left ear. That leans you toward peripheral disease. Same is true for unilateral tinnitus. <clears throat> positional, as we will discuss, is not always benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. There are lots of other things that cause positional dizziness, changes with pressure, and paroxysmal patterns make us think about peripheral disease. <laughs> Absence of hearing loss may lean us toward neurological disease. I have reported, published on papers with autoimmune inner ear disease that's presented with vertigo alone, with normal hearing and with no tinnitus, that responds to treatment, steroids and cytotoxic medication goes away, you stop the treatment, eventually it comes back, you retreat, it definitely goes away. So there are also peripheral causes, inability to lateralize, absence of tinnitus, but tinnitus is commonly present with neurologic disease and it's present in at least 35 million people. So doesn't tell you very much constancy and association with repeated loss of consciousness leans you towards central disease. So do other neurological symptoms, blurred vision, slurred speech, memory loss, headaches, 
you can also have all of those things from other neurologic conditions, as you all know well, and have dizziness from a coincident peripheral condition. Again, useful to know, trend your thinking, but don't define your diagnosis. People who get dizzy after meals, especially heavy sugar meals, you consider hypoglycemia. <clears throat> hypothyroidism, uh, menopause, and premenstrual hormonal environment sometimes cause dizziness. Of course, exposure to a variety of toxins. There are too many people who do not recognize or believe that cervical vertigo exists, and they are just wrong. There often, but not always, is a history of trauma. You can sometimes spot people because when they come in the office, one shoulder is higher than the other. You sometimes see that in women who carry heavy purses as shoulder bags. Stiffness in the neck and shoulders. On exam, there's tenderness over C2 area, and often you'll feel C2 shifted to one side. That's commonly accompanied by headaches, often posterior headaches. And it is also positional. If people who have cervical malalignment and, and atlas axis related vertigo, remember the spinal accessory pathway sensors are between the vertebrae, the upper cervical vertebrae. So if, if you are compressing and irritating spinocerebellar sensors, you're giving a message that you're turning in one direction, which is the aberrant signal. I know many neurologists are very reluctant to believe what I'm about to say, but for these patients, an excellent chiropractor or osteopath who knows how to do cervical manipulation cures them, sometimes in one visit. Now, I said excellent because if you are going to allow people to manipulate a neck, and especially if you haven't cleared the neck neurologically and in the absence of symptoms other than tenderness over the lateral processes, you're not always going to get a cervical MRI, perhaps. You need to know that the practitioner with whom you are working is competent. Yes, it is correct that there are a lot of bad, potentially dangerous chiropractors out there. There are also some really excellent ones. There are different chiropractic techniques. The, the one I personally favor for people with this problem is called a lift. Most chiropractors, when they adjust necks, have people lie down and twist the neck. There is another technique in which people sit and lift the neck so that there is no twisting motion. I have never heard of a problem with that technique, but it's hard to find people who are trained to do it. But it's really worthwhile because if you make that diagnosis, you can have people asymptomatic until several months later when they sleep the wrong way and go in and get readjusted. So I suggest that you keep an open mind, but learn enough about the techniques involved from osteopaths or excellent chiropractors so that you know whether the person is going to see somebody safe. Hysteria and malingering are not common. Um, of course, one of the first hints is that there's a paralegal in the office with, with the new patient. Failure to complete the symptoms and atypical symptoms and signs. There's also some objective testing for atypical signs that we will talk about shortly. <clears throat> there is a potential major problem in industry. I'm heavily involved in occupational hearing loss. My father was 
one of the founders of that field, his first book in 1957 was called Industrial Deafness. So I interact with industry a lot for hearing problems. I do not understand why the lawyers haven't taken full advantage of dizziness because here's the position that you and I are in. You have some 240 pound foreman who gets hit in his hard hat by an empty one pint milk carton and says, oh doc, I'm dizzy, I can't work. You know that he's a crock. But if you write down, there's nothing wrong with this person, he should go back to work. If he's not too bright, he'll put his arm in a piece of machinery and injure himself. If he's smarter, <clears throat> he'll drop a forklift full of steel into a crowd and say, I told that doc I was dizzy. It's not my fault. I had a dizzy attack. We don't have any very good tests that prove someone has no equilibrium problem. We have good tests for hearing. There, there are several objective tests that we can use to say, no, this person's hearing threshold is not what he claimed. And even to give a pretty good approximation within 10 to 20 decibels of what the real threshold is, we don't have a good equivalent for dizziness. So we're, we're in a tough position if somebody in a dangerous job complains about being dizzy. There are lots of peripheral causes, including something as simple as cerumen impaction. People use Q-tips, otolaryngologists, <clears throat> otolaryngologists joke about there being two kinds of people, people who use Q-tips and people who lie about not using Q-tips. <clears throat> there are a few who actually don't, but if people use Q-tips and impact cerumen against the eardrum enough to push the malleus medially, that can cause dizziness. Nice, same with foreign bodies, easy to cure. Otosclerosis primarily causes hearing loss, but a substantial number have abnormal VNGs and some have dizziness clinically that goes away with stapes surgery. Otitis media, in some series, that's inflammatory, of course, in some series, as many as 6% of people with typical high drops, Meniere's syndrome, were found to have it on an allergic basis and have it disappear with immunotherapy. Of course, trauma, Meniere's disease, I will mention to you all, is idiopathic. Meniere's syndrome is fluctuating vertigo, episodic vertigo, ear fullness, fluctuating hearing loss, and usually tinnitus, most frequently a seashell, low-pitched kind of tinnitus. That's caused by endolymphatic high drops. I'll show you a picture. And that can come from everything from syphilis to head trauma to hypothyroidism. You can't really call it Meniere's disease until you've ruled out all the recognized and potentially treatable causes. And of course, there are disorders that are vestibulotoxic. We use, most people use as one of the treatments for intractable peripheral dizziness, genomycin injections because streptomycin is hard to get and it's expensive and many people don't know the difference, but that's a perfect example. Genomycin injected into the middle ear and absorbed through the round window is fairly equally cochleotoxic and vestibulotoxic. Streptomycin is prefer preferentially vestibulotoxic. You can ordinarily use very high doses. It usually takes 20 to 30 grams to mostly kill off a labyrinth. People have had 80 and 90 grams before developing any kind of hearing loss. So not only are there many ototoxic drugs that can damage the system, but they also provide us with a therapeutic window. Endolymphatic high drops I just mentioned to you, syphilis, hypothyroidism, and diabetes can cause those similar symptoms. Hypoglycemia we discussed, 
Fistula is a connection between the fluid-filled inner ear and the air-filled middle ear. It allows escape of microscopic amounts of endolymph and usually causes pretty significant rotary vertigo and often hearing loss. Of course, not always. For It usually comes after trauma, but it can be barrow trauma, even a forceful nose blow or sneeze. Typically, when we do a physical exam, which we will come to, we push air in the ear. We do pneumatic otoscopy so that we can see the eardrum move back and forth, just as you would when you're looking for fluid. If the eardrum's intact, that's called a Hennebeer's test or Hennebeer's sign. If there's a hole in the eardrum, it's a fistula sign. If you push the eardrum back and forth and the patient gets dizzy from it, you can think about a fistula. However, it's important for you to know that Dr. Hennebeer described that finding for loetic labyrinthitis, syphilis of the inner ear. So you can get dizziness from that test with endolymphatic high drops too. In addition, if somebody has a significant head injury and a little dizziness and you're concerned about a fistula and you do a Hennebeer's test or a fistula test and it's negative, you have to know that you have a responsive labyrinth in order to be able to trust the negative. And, and not explore it surgically. And that's easy. You take 10 cc's of ice water, instill them in the ear, and the patient should get dizzy and develop nystagmus. If you can fill up the ear with ice water and nothing happens, then your fistula test and your Hennebeer sign are not valid. You can't count on them. Uh, incidentally, for the residents in the room, I don't think they'll ask you this on neurology boards, but usually when we do those tests, we go by subjective dizziness in the patient. It's nice to see a little nystagmus, but if people ask you what a positive fistula test is, the correct answer is conjugate deviation of the eyes, not subjective dizziness. Inflammatory conditions, ischemia, peripheral or central, benign paroxysmal vertigo, and autoimmune disease, which is missed routinely. Superior semicircular canal dehiscence sometimes has dizziness. It usually causes more autophonia and a false conductive hearing loss. CP angle tumors or anything else that causes pressure on the nerve and neurovascular complex. Central causes, you all know well, and we have so many things to talk about, and I want to leave time for questions that I won't review neurological disorders that can cause dizziness. But I will stress to you that the characteristics of the dizziness are really variable. Migraine and Migranous vertigo, including acephalgic migranous vertigo, are really common and really treatable. When I suspect those problems, I refer the patients to a neurologist and request a therapeutic trial of a migraine preventive medication. It does not help us as neurotologists when the neurologist says, oh, I, I don't really think you have migraine. If, if we're concerned enough to send a month or six weeks of an anti-migraine medication trial usually seems reasonable and not particularly harmful. Uh, so please consider that and consider that it may well be acephalgic. Not all of us look for cervical vertigo and cervical headache even in patients with headache. If you find that, it's perfectly reasonable to treat that. Now, temporal lobe epilepsy can cause classic vertigo that looks peripheral. Now, 
I may have enough time to tell you a story. Bob Schwartzman and I were extremely close friends and we got to be close friends his first year at Jefferson when he sent me a patient who had classic vertigo. He said, it's not neurologic, it's the ear. And Bob was usually right over the years, but I didn't buy it. I sent the patient for an EEG. The patient had a classic temporal lobe focus. I sent the patient back to Bob for anti-epileptic medications and the dizziness was completely cured with controlling the temporal lobe epilepsy. epilepsy and Schwartzman loved it. He didn't say, oh, I missed a diagnosis and you found it. He said, fantastic, I can't believe you found that. And we worked closely together for the next 20 years. So that can happen and can be missed even by the best of neurologists. So think about it. We do a comprehensive neurological examination, which should, even before the patients get to you, include looking for nystagmus, dysdiadocokinesis, dysmetria, drift, Romberg and tandem Romberg tests with eyes closed and other tests. We also look for potential systemic causes, diabetes being among them. We do either clinically or with equipment, some evaluation of the semicircular canals. Typically that's done with video nice diagmography, but you can get lots of information from a good balanced physical examination in the office. There is visual suppression of nystagmus. So if you're going to rely on office maneuvers, it is better to use Frenzel glasses. There are nice Frenzel glasses that have lights inside that make it easy for you to see the eyes and make it even harder for the patient to focus. <laughs> we do more complex audiologic testing than you usually see. There is more to testing hearing, which is often associated with peripheral dizziness, than a routine audiogram, which measures air, bone, speech, and discrimination at about eight of more than 20,000 frequencies. So you can get a completely normal audiogram, which includes 4,000, 6,000, and 8,000, and have a substantial hearing loss at 5,250 hertz, a dip that's missed completely. We can test all of those. We have equipment in the office and use it regularly. You can test high frequencies, many audiometers to 14 or 16,000 hertz, some to 20,000 hertz. But they're particularly useful in patients receiving ototoxic medicines like chemotherapy. High frequencies are damaged first by most of those ototoxic drugs. If you wait until they damage an, a routine audiogram, you have hearing loss down to 8,000 hertz. You can see that at 14 or 12,000 hertz long before it becomes measurable on a routine audiogram. Brainstem evoked response audiometry you're familiar with. There is central audiological testing. There is also testing fair and used mostly in children for auditory processing disorders. They are seen most commonly in our practice with people who come in, you say, why are you here? The spouse says he can't hear and you have a normal audiogram. And you ask them when you read, study, do you do it with a radio or television on or do you need quiet? And they'll say, oh, I need quiet. If somebody turns on a vacuum cleaner next to these people, it slows their reading speed. Well, that's not hearing loss. That's central auditory processing disorder. But you know how common that processing disorders are after head injuries and how common dizziness is after head injuries. So they often go together and should be thought of and sought both as, as concurring information and also to improve quality of life because you can at least tell people how to deal with that. 
ENG or VNG, which is what we do now, measures the balance system peripherally, and there are other options. So with video nystagmography, you do basically the same thing that we do when we do office irrigations, except you have a system to record it. And the system depends on the fact that the eye is a dipole. So when it moves, you can track it electrically. And that's how you measure nystagmus on a VNG. If, if I could ask the residents questions, I would, and the question would be, which is more sensitive for detecting nystagmus, the video nystagmography machine or the human eye? And the answer is the human eye by an order of magnitude. Digressing again, I will tell you that I'm in the middle of a research project now. I don't have enough preliminary data to tell you but clearly there are eye movement abnormalities in dizzy patients. I am looking at video recordings of eyes in normal patients and in dizzy patients without stimulation using Eulerian motion. If you are not familiar with Eulerian motion, I'd love to be able to give you a 10 minute homework assignment for after this lecture. Google invisible motion and look at the MIT TED Talk. And you will be astonished at what you can see using freeware and what motion exists in a normal person that we can't detect with our eyes. And it will not surprise me if there is abnormal eye motion that we can't detect in the eyes of dizzy patients that we might even be able to categorize and use for diagnostic purposes, I'll let you know. But if you're not familiar with invisible motion, Peter, even you, you're gonna love this. I stumbled across it by accident several years ago. We've already published a few things on it. We're working on more. I, I think it's a, a fascinating window. Take a look. I mentioned vestibular masking. I like it because it's a test I invented and published in the 80s. But I'll tell you the story because it's such an amalgam of neurology and neurotology. I was asked to consult at Jefferson in the 80s on a patient on the floor who was really severely dizzy. He had bilateral, fairly symmetrical Meniere's disease and he had lung mets to his brain. Now, one of the things we do for bilateral Meniere's disease is intramuscular streptomycin injections, which causes streptomycin labyrinthectomy, which essentially would wipe out both labyrinths. So the assumption when the neuro, neuroservices consulted us was that he was dizzy from his Meniere's disease but I couldn't tell whether he was dizzy from his Meniere's disease or his brain mets. ENG at that time showed fairly symmetric response on both sides. So out of desperation, I got a resident and 250 cc syringes with ice water. And we slowly simultaneously irrigated both ears with ice water, figuring that if we massively overloaded both ears and they had fairly symmetric caloric function. If we massively overloaded them with ice stimulation, while they were responding for the, to the ice stimulation, they would be out of the circuit for balance maintenance. And in his case, he became profoundly more dizzy. He couldn't even sit still in bed. He was holding onto the bed, moving around. He had no nystagmus. There was no caloric response on one side over the other. And as the stimulus wore away, he went back to baseline. If I had done a medical labyrinthectomy on him, he would have been completely profoundly disabled 
And I've used that test routinely over the years since to help figure out whether we're looking at peripheral or central disorders. If you have central dizziness from brain mets, the ears are helping to compensate. So the last thing you wanna do is a labyrinthectomy medical or otherwise. So that test hasn't been widely picked up, but it's useful and its genesis gives you an example of the kind of problems that neurologists and neurotologists have to work on together to sort out and how easy it is to make a mistake and make the patient worse. Now, VNG is the standard of care for unilateral vestibular dysfunction. Rotary chair testing is more helpful for bilateral vestibular dysfunction. It also has some advantages. There are no contraindications like neck injury, which is a problem with VNG. It can be used on children. It's easy. It's well to tolerated. It gives you information on the vestibular ocular and ocular motor pathways that you can follow over time. Some people with balance disorders recover. It stimulates the reflexes at a higher level and caloric testing assesses the system at 0 0.003 Hertz, rotary chair at 0 0.01 to 0 0.064 Hertz. So it's useful adjunct information and especially useful in people with bilateral vestibular disorders. Computerized dynamic posturography is another one of my favorites. We had the first unit in the city and did some publication with it, particularly publication on aphysiologic vertigo. There are two components to a CDP. It's at the opposite spectrum in terms of global assessment from VNG. VNG tests some central issues, but in the peripheral system, it tests one labyrinth at a time and primarily the horizontal semicircular canal. The platforms test how people function walking around down a grocery store aisle for all intents and purposes. So there's a sensory organization test, which has six components and responses are measured by changes in position, balance, adjustments, through the feet using a, a template. And essentially it's various versions of a Romberg. It's a Romberg with all other factors steady. It's a Romberg in the absence of vision. It's a Romberg with the visual field that is this visual surround moving away. People who are depending on vision to maintain balance will sway forward when you move the visual surround. Normal people who are able to use their vestibular systems, for example, don't. They recognize that. And the other tests are more complicated. They're the same things with the platform moving or the eyes closed. There's also a movement coordination test where there are sudden perturbations back and forth and at angles. And those responses are reflex, are measured and can't be faked. So we did a research project looking for characteristics of people who are really dizzy versus characteristics who, of people who are faking dizziness, including volunteers and legitimate malingerers. And there is a list of characteristics that show up on computerized dynamic posturography only in people with aphysiologic dizziness. So it is helpful and provides quantitative information on people you're fairly sure are faking it, which makes it a little easier for us to say that. Vestibular evoked myogenic potentials aren't used as widely as they probably should be, but they've come into greater use because of superior semicircular canal dehiscence in which they 
typically are abnormal. And there are subcategories that look at the inferior vestibular nerve and saccule and superior vestibular nerves. So they can help make our diagnoses more precise. In addition to glucose and other metabolic issues, all of the conditions we talked about, syphilis, Lyme, COVID, HIV, and others can affect nerves and therefore can affect balance. High resolution CT helps us look at the superior semicircular canals, but mostly we used enhanced CT in evaluating these patients. There are some people in whom you have a high suspicion of a problem in the internal auditory canal. And for one reason or another, like a pacemaker, they can't undergo MR and even your 3T machine doesn't give you a good enough view. For the residents, please remember that some of us are old enough to have existed before MRIs did. Um, in, in my talk on acoustic neuromas, I show an early MRI in which there was argument about what was going on laterally for three or four millimeters in the canal. Um, most people said it was just a filling defect. I kind of thought it was a tumor. And we evaluated it with an air CT and it made it really obvious that it was a tumor which we ended up removing. But air CT is a test in which you inject air into the spine, float the air up into the cerebellum pontine angle, and it outlines the IAC region beautifully. You can see ICA, you can see the nerve. If ICA is pressing against the nerve enough to make its course alter and to create a little arachnoid reaction around the contact point, it shows that very clearly and that makes it more convincing when you're talking about a vas potential vascular loop compression. And the symptoms from that are the same as the symptoms from an acoustic. And so is the ABR, retrochochlear pathology. There is a place for dynamic imaging. Of course, we do lots of non-surgical treatment before we even think about surgery. Physical therapy is used a lot Remember, however, that BPPV and cervical vertigo are not the only causes of positional vertigo. One of the wastebasket diagnoses in dizziness is vertebrobasilar insufficiency. However, there is such a thing. The only time I make that diagnosis is when I send these people for a vertebral artery ultrasound in neutral flexed extended and head turn positions. You have to fight with the ultrasonographer because it's not one of their routine protocols, but we've been doing it since the 80s. So you can get people to do it. Every once in a while, you will find people who, and we instruct the patients to make sure they turn their heads into the provocative position, who will turn their head to the left, the position that makes them dizzy, get dizzy, and the vertebral flow cuts off and they turn their head back to neutral and they get blood flow in the vertebral artery and the dizziness goes away. As far as I'm concerned, that's when you can really make a diagnosis of vertebral basilar insufficiency. And sometimes we manage those people with counseling, but I have sent them to your neurosurgical group and other neurosurgical groups before. And every once in a while, they benefit from decompression. We didn't talk about Chiari malformations, but that's another central problem in the same category. There are two basic principles to physical therapy. You should, you should know what's going on when you send people. One is positioning. That's things like the Epley maneuver, in which the object is to float some of the four millimeter calcium otoconia out of the utricle, utricle and float them back to where they belong in the semicircular canal, that's positioning. And habituation is training people to open up other pathways to either detect or suppress balance signals. 
every physical therapy place does balance therapy and very few do it well. One of the hints is knowing that there is a therapist there who is specifically trained in vestibular therapy. Another is the presence of expensive equipment like a balance master, which costs 60 or $80,000. Balance therapy is not putting people on stroke bars or foam and dome, and it's not even having them do eye exercises. It's complex and it works extremely well in good hands. In average hands, or if people can't get to a decent balance center, frankly, ballroom dancing works as well as the foam and dome and, and stuff you get from most of the places you send people. We talked about intratympanic and medical streptomycin, and there is surgery. There are a lot of factors that go into making a decision about surgery. One of them is occupation. Uh, we hesitate to do surgery and we hesitate to not do surgery. For example, on roofers, people in whom a slight momentary balance problem might create a fatal risk. Uh, but there are lots of things that can be done there's a magnet, which is a pressure device, which all you have to do is a myringotomy tube. You can do endolymphatic sac decompression. That's endolymphatic hydrops. That's the normal Reissner's membrane. And that's the inner ear fluid overload. There are several procedures for that. Vestibular nerve labyrinthectomy, where you make people totally deaf, has about a 70% success rate. Vestibular nerve section, over 90%. This is a typical picture. The eighth nerve does not have the nice cleavage plane you see in the drawings. That's ICA. You create a cleavage plane. This is the vestibular division resected. This is ICA moved out of the internal auditory canal and protected with Teflon felt. So the bottom line before we go to questions is dizziness is not hopeless. More often than not, we can help people one way or another. But if we wanna find the few that we can really cure and control the dizziness, we have to do so in a systematic, comprehensive fashion. We need to have an open mind and start working on the assumption that we are going to find something that we can treat and keep that until we've exhausted all possibilities and can't. And then we work with the physical therapist and find ways to help the people adapt. And we keep them coming back because every year we come up with something new. And if we lose track of them and our abilities to care for these people improve, they won't know about it. So, Dr. Glebus asked me to leave five minutes for questions, and there they are. Thank you very much, Dr. Sattel. It was a great overview. And as you said, you know, it's such a common problem in your clinics and in our clinics. And, so, and, and uh, uh, especially with the aging population, we see more and more. Um, uh, we get we actually have several questions. So I'm going to start. Oh, by the way, I, I was very intrigued with this invisible motion. So I'm definitely going to look, look, look it up. It, it will only take you 10 minutes. And you'll be fascinated and knowing you, you're going to walk away and say, how is it possible that I never knew about this before? <laughs> well, as I said, I'm going to do it today at the end of the day. So, all right. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to migraine as dizziness and especially acephalgic migraine as dizziness, what findings from your perspective or lack of findings, you know, on your examination and evaluation that can bring the possibility of this being acephalgic migraine, dis dizziness related to acephalgic migraine? Great question. The answer is when the patient has fairly typical peripheral symptoms and everything that I test in the peripheral system turns out normal or close enough to normal that it doesn't explain the symptoms and the symptom severity, I think of migraine. All right. Okay. And I think, you know, that I, I, I've seen that and I, I, I believe I've seen patients on from you too. I think it's a very reasonable 
uh, to do that uh, 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 approach to do a therapeutic trial because I mean it's it's a low side effect, <laughs> low, low low negativity, and you might really you know uh, solve the problem. Um, next question is when do you get comfortable with diagnosing psychogenic dizziness? Because that's another thing you know the the what what it, it, probably the same approach what findings or the lack of findings when you think okay this probably is psychogenic dizziness. Yeah, that's that's another great question, and it's it's always a, a a hard diagnosis to make. However, the typical aphysiologic findings on the computerized dynamic posturography really make me considerably more comfortable. There are some fairly classic things. Um, for example, in the first three segments of the sensory organization test. They are relatively easy. So people will kind of move around all over the place and fake it. However, conditions four, five, and six are much more challenging. People feel like they're going to fall. So they reflexively stop themselves from falling. So when you see people who do much worse on the easy conditions than they do on the hard conditions, that makes you wonder. On the motor control test, you have the reflex reaction, which is always there. And then if they're moving around pretending to fall after you have the reflex response, that also is not physiologic. So that's one. But when all of the testing that you do turns up essentially normal, and especially if they have a history of having psychological problems in psychotherapy and in the presence of abnormal a physiologic CDP. Hmm. It's a reasonable call. And we do the same thing. We send them to a good psychological professional, just as we would do with a good migraine professional and get them evaluated. Um, another question. I have a patient diagnosed with a paroxysmal position of a vertigo resistant to multiple vestibular suppressant medications, physical therapy, only partially effective. Are there any surgical options for these patients? Now, say the first part of that again. The patient, well, with, a patient with a, a paroxysmal positional uh, 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 disorder that is resistant to multiple vestibular suppressant medications, physical therapy, only partially effective. Okay. Absolutely. There is a variety of medications. If it is posterior canal stenosis or canal pathology that you can identify on one side, there's a fairly straightforward operation called singular neurectomy, which can actually be done through the ear, through, through the middle ear without having to do a whole mastoid. Uh, the more definitive is a vestibular nerve section. Uh, they work really well. Now, the principle of labyrinthectomy or nerve section of any sort, remember we said at the beginning that you're dizzy because you have conflicting signals, but it's a redundant system. So if you have an ear, for example, with Meniere's sy syndromes, that's giving out constantly fluctuating signals about where you are in space, the body can't adapt. Mm -hmm. If you disconnect it and it's giving out no signals, there's plenty of information coming from elsewhere. And when you eliminate the aberrant signal, it goes away. So for somebody with that condition, simply disconnecting the balance system from the brain is curative. Mm -hmm. How often is rotator chair testing performed these days? Huh. Well, depends who you're talking to. I would say I have it done two to four times a week. Okay. And when I moved to Drexel, I kind of ran out of room for the CDP and a rotary chair. So I do the VEMPs and ABRs and VNGs and everything in the office. And I, I send my people over to Penn for the CDP and rotary chair. Um, and I have a special arrangement with them so they don't have to see a Penn doctor to get tested. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find it invaluable. Okay. Um, you mentioned the positional dizziness. It's now it's not only paroxysmal or uh, BPPV. Uh, you mentioned another uh, as a you know vertebral basilar insufficiency. Anything else can give positional dizziness. Well, cervical vertigo 
if yeah. you have if you have atlas axis problems and you you turn your neck into the the wrong position you'll get rotary vertigo so those are the those are the three biggies okay uh, you also mentioned that the sonogram, uh, you know, to use a sonogram, vertebral, vertebral artery sonogram to evaluate for vertebral basilar insufficiency. Um, where can you get it where you can actually trust where the sonographer will will do the provocative maneuvers and evaluate that? Is you know, where do you get those studies? Um, Jefferson, Penn, I am currently fighting with mainline. They used to do them, but they stopped and I've talked to them. Uh, and I have had them done successfully at Crozier, and I've had people go to Crozier and have everything except those studies done. So we can both talk to the Crozier people and make sure that it's in the protocol. But it is absolutely simple. I mean, no additional equipment. It's just an extra couple minutes. It's you, you do the regular thing and then say, turn your head all the way to the right, turn it all the way to the left, flex it, extend it. And is there a specific position we didn't do that makes you dizzy? And that's it. And and put the sensor over the vertebral artery while you're doing it. So you should be able to get it done anywhere. Uh, mainline health, unfortunately, is exceedingly protocol oriented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and no matter how commonsensical everything is, if it's not in writing in their system, they stop doing it. But So I wouldn't go to mainline health right now. Or but anywhere else, I, when I've interacted with Crozier, they've been reasonable, and part of the time they've been complete and successful. All right, and I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Um, Post-COVID dizziness and vertigo, um, what do you know about it? Is it more peripheral or central or both, and you know how to treat these people? It can be both. We have people with COVID that causes hearing loss that causes peripheral balance dysfunction, facial paralysis, uh, tinnitus. We've published on people with substantial paralysis in all six of the laryngeal nerves we test on EMG. But we also have had people with COVID who have persistent brain fog and, and long COVID. So even though we have peripheral dysfunction, and we're sure there's peripheral dysfunction, I certainly am not convinced that there isn't some central component in, in people who have persistent cognitive dysfunction and, and other central post-COVID, long COVID pathology. What do you think about that? Do, do you see a fair number of yes. post- Not even post-COVID, also post-vaccine, post-COVID vaccine. It's, and I, you know, I assume it's probably similar. There, there should be then, you know, some immunological mechanism, not only direct direct uh, viral invasion. It's it's really difficult to say. I mean, we do know that virus crosses blood brain barrier, right? you know, and and during the autopsies, we you know they they find viral particles in the brain. Uh, but I, I I I agree with you. It's probably it just whatever was hit was it peripheral? Was it central? You know, it could be it could be both. So. Because for me also, I, I, I've seen a good number of post-vaccine dizziness. I saw first one, I said, you know, you know, maybe that could be, you know, some psychogenic component. But when you start seeing them repeatedly, it's like, well, you, you know, it's, it cannot be only that. Yeah, and they're, they're a challenge to treat because if they have a peripheral component, we can usually treat that. But a lot of the things that we use to suppress the peripheral component will make the central component worse and make the patients sleepy. Physical therapy has worked for those people better than anything else, but I've tried combinations of everything until I find something that works for each individual. And Dr. Sadilov, that was a great talk about the great topic. Uh, uh, it was a real pleasure having you. And uh, for everybody who joined, I would like to invite everybody again in two weeks, our next grand rounds, uh, Dr. Greenberg will be talking about acute stroke care. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed being with everybody.